Okay, the second talk of the session is dismantling the OT64 automotive cipher, and the talk is given by Christopher X. Thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, so yeah, I'm presenting dismantling the OT64 automotive cipher, which is work that I did with Flavio Garcia and David Oswald. And the structure of the presentation is that first I'm going to introduce the automotive context in which OT64 is used, then I'm going to describe the cipher, present the cryptanalysis work that we did, and then conclude with the practical implications. So AUT64 is an immobilizer solution. An immobilizer is an authentication system, which is designed to prevent vehicle hot wiring. And the way in which it does this is um, a transponder, a passive device is embedded in your car key, and a coil is placed around the ignition barrel in your vehicle. And then when the transponder is brought sufficiently close to the ignition, uh, the transponder is powered up, and an authentication protocol proceeds between the transponder and the immobilizer box. Um, specifically, we looked at an Atmel transponder chip and an immobilizer box from a Mazda. And AUT64 is also used as a remote keyless entry system. So these are the uh, press button to unlock vehicle door systems. And that was where AUT64 was first discovered in 2016. So AUT64 is a proprietary cipher. And so the first thing that we had to do was to recover the implementation. And so to do this, we um, recovered the firmware from the immobilizer box loaded it up into IDA, and then by cross-referencing the patents and data sheets, we were able to recover all of the subroutines. And what we found is a 64-bit block cipher with a 120-bit key. And so to begin with, we were quite surprised, and we thought we might have found quite a secure design. I'm sure many of you have seen recently that the Tesla Model S has been using a, a, a cipher with a 40-bit key. Um, for, for some of its keyless, uh, keyless entry systems. And uh, what also makes AUT64 quite unusual and quite interesting is that it has an unbalanced Feistel network structure. And so classically, Feistel networks are balanced, iterative, round-based designs, wherein each round, the half of the state is changed by the output of the round function, whereas in an unbalanced design, some proportion other than half is changed. And um, also, quite, quite unusually, rather than the security of AUT64 uh, resting in the secrecy of the key, it actually also rests in the structure of the key, and the security is dependent on the specific structure of the key. Um, it operates for either 8 or 24 rounds, dependent on a bit which is flipped in the transponder. And until now, there's been no in-depth cryptanalysis or study of an immobilizer implementation, and that's what I'm presenting today. So this is the AUT64 block cipher. It takes as input eight bytes, and then a byte permutation is applied. The permuted bytes are then input to a round function f, which outputs one byte in each round. The round function comprises a compression function g, which takes as input eight bytes and outputs a single byte. And then there's a small substitution permutation network, which has one S box at both the input and output, and then a bitwise permutation in between the two. The compression function looks like this. There are two main properties, which are that it operates nibblewise, and there are three lookup tables. And so, first of all, each byte in the input is divided into its upper and lower four bits. And then the first two lookup tables prescribe permutations of the compression function key part. That's TU and TL in this diagram. And for each nibble in the input, a nibble from the key is appended and used as input to the third lookup table, T offset. T offset out outputs nibbles and an XOR sum of values from T offset is computed for the output of the function. An AUT64 key has three components. It has a bit string, the compression function key, which is 32 bits. It has a permutation key part, which describes an eight element permutation. And it has a substitution key part, which describes a four by four S box. And this gives us a nominal 120 bit key size. 
And in terms of the dependence of AUT64 on the structure of the key, both the byte permutation in the Feistel network and the bit permutation in the substitution permutation network is defined by the permutation key. And the S boxes in the round function are defined by the substitution key part. And of course, because substitutions and permutations have structure, they're not just random bit strings. The actual entropy in a key is reduced from the 120 bits uh, to only around 91 and a half based on the possible combinations of permutations and substitutions. And um, if we think about this a little bit more, the first thing that you realize is that the byte permutation has to have the property of being cyclic. And this is because the permutation mixes the output from the round function in the subsequent rounds with the other bytes. And so if the permutation weren't cyclic, then uh, there would actually be bytes of the plain text present in the cipher text, even after an arbitrary number of rounds. And uh, we might also want our S boxes to be resistant to linear and differential um, cryptanalysis. And a result by Saarinen indicates that there are around 2 to the 40 of these from the 2 to the 44 total S box space. And for a reason we'll see in just a few slides, uh, the compression function key should not contain any nibbles with the value 0. And so perhaps the total entropy of an AUT64 key is just 83 bits. But this is still too much for us to brute force. It's still quite secure. And so we proceeded to do some cryptanalysis to see if we could weaken the cipher. And we focused on a chosen plain text cryptanalysis where what we were trying to do was just distinguish the output of 8 round AUT64 from that of a random permutation. And the first thing that we realized is that in the first round, if all of the bytes in our chosen plain text have the same value, then we can nullify the byte permutation. And so we can uh, have quite tight control over the input to the round function in the first round. And so if there were any cryptographic weakness in the round function, um, we'd be able to, to learn the output from the first round and distinguish it from the other bytes in the, in the ciphertext. And in terms of the round function, what we would hope is that the output was uniformly random. And we would also hope that the output from the compression function was uniformly random. But because the S box is a 4 by 4 component, um, it's necessary that the S boxes operate nibble-wise on the upper and lower four bits of the byte output from the compression function. And so it's likely that this function's only going to operate um, uniformly and randomly if the compression function outputs bytes uniformly and at random. Unfortunately, what we found, or fortunately, is that it doesn't do this. And the main reason for this is the nibblewise operation and the property of the XOR sum that computes the output. And so um, each nibble in the input has uh, a nibble from the key appended to it, and this is used to select values from the T offset lookup table. And the key nibble selects a row, and the input nibble selects a column. And so in the case where all of the input nibbles have the same value, then we fix one column in this table, and the key nibbles select, uh, select rows. Um, now, because the key schedule just prescribes a permutation of the key part, then what's going to happen in this scenario is that we will compute a sum of the same set of values for both the upper and lower nibble. And the order in which the sum is computed will differ, but because XOR is commutative, the output byte will be symmetric, and the, out, and the, and the upper nibble will be equal to the lower nibble. And so this forms the basis of a divide and conquer attack, where what we can do is uh, force the output of the compression function to always be symmetric. So we build the set of chosen plain texts, where each plain text has the property that all of the nibbles have the same value. So uh, all zeros, all ones, all the way to f all the way through to 15. And um, what will happen is the compression function will output a symmetric byte. The S box will operate nibble-wise, and we will still have a symmetric byte. 
The bitwise permutation will typically remove the symmetry, but not in the case where the input to the, per to the bitwise permutation, all of the bits are 1 or all of the bits are 0, because no matter how these are mixed, it will, it will have the same value. And so for at least 2 out of the 16 plain texts, we will have a symmetric byte in the output from the first round. And this forms the basis of a, of a probabilistic attack that allows us to distinguish the, um, the first round, the output of the first round from the other bytes. And so this is um, the 16, what, what 16 ciphertexts might look like corresponding to these chosen plain texts. And you can see that in this case, the uh, fifth column features eight symmetric bytes. And so we know that this is the output from the first round. And once we do this, we learn uh, immediately one element from the permutation, which corresponds to the position from the first round after, after eight rounds. And um, in the average case, where there are two symmetric bytes, we also learn nearly two elements from the S box. So if there are only two, then the inputs which caused them were all zeros or all one bits. And in the paper, we show how we can make this attack non-probabilistic. Um, of course, so, so, so this gives us a, 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 a remaining entropy or uncertainty in the key value of still around 77 bits. But fortunately, learning the, um, this element from the permutation that corresponds to the first round of encryption forms the basis of a much more significant attack uh, in which we actually reduce the security to just 2 to the 51 encryptions in which we can recover the 420-bit key. And uh, the way in which this works is we set all of the input nibbles to 0 except for one target nibble, which we assign each of the possible values, 0 to 15. And the um, T offset table will uh, output a 0 for each of the input nibbles, which have the value 0. And only four bits of the compression function key will be used to uh, compute the output in, in, in under these attack conditions. And so essentially, we just brute force the remaining key space, which is the uncertainty that we have in the S box, the bitwise permutation and just um, 15 possible values for one nibble of the compression function key. Um, and, uh, and so that, that concludes the cryptanalysis part of this talk. We um, found an attack which can recover the full 120-bit key of AUT64 using just 2 to the 51 encryptions. And in, so in terms of the implementation, what we found is that although the default in the Atmel transponder is eight rounds of AUT64, they had in fact implemented 24 rounds. And so they were clearly conscious of security when they designed the system. And they've combined it with a bespoke challenge response protocol in which an ID code is first transmitted from the transponder to the base station or the immobilizer box. A nonce is generated encoded using a proprietary stream cipher, um, which is deterministic. And then both the transponder and the immobilizer box compute the AUT64 encryption of the nonce. And then the result is compared, and authentication succeeds uh, if, if it matches. And unfortunately, we also found some very weak key management. In fact, the compression function key is derived deterministically from the ID code of the transponder. And the patent prescribes that the uh, permutation key part is actually there are just 16 values assigned to each automotive manufacturer. And finally, we found some evidence that the substitution key part can be fixed across different vehicles. So to conclude, um, we we've shown that 8 round AUT64 is certainly not a secure block cipher and that we can recover the 420-bit key in less than 2 to the 51 encryptions. 8-round uh, AUT64 with a known compression function key, for instance, because it's derived from the ID code of the transponder, can be broken within milliseconds. 
And this is because once we know the output of the compression function and we know the output of the encryption, the final ciphertext value, you can very quickly attack the small substitution permutation network. And for most key values, there's very little um, entropy in that. And finally, 24 round or 64 is more secure. We'd expect that with a block cipher that the more rounds we apply, the more security we tend to get. But it's broken in practice owing to weak key management. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Question? Command, no? Maybe one short question. Um, are you aware of uh, some rationales be behind the, the design of this block cipher? Some rationale behind yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I think that the. It's designed to be bijective, which is not apparent from the design of the protocol. So it clearly was designed for more uses than just this. Um, and that's evident from the T offset lookup table, which is actually symmetric about the descending diagonal. And it's why the, imp the key nibbles for the compression function key part can never be zero, because if they are, then all nim input nibbles are encoded to the value zero, and you lose the information that allows you to invert the function when you run it backwards. But beyond that, um, it seems to be just a, a, a sort of relatively classical combination of confusion and diffusion. But it's ineffective when it's used in, a, in, in eight rounds. But it, it seems that there are weak keys in, uh, in this kind of uh, design. It yeah. seems that all, not all the possible keys are uh, of the same behavior related yeah. to. Yeah. That's certainly, certainly the permutation key part is quite constrained. It certainly needs to be cyclic. Um, I think using S boxes at random tends to produce relatively reasonable S boxes. Mm -hmm. That's not you, you can design AES with um, key dependent S boxes and it can be secure. And did you did you see a document explaining the studying the the, the the classical, such, uh, the classical attacks against a black cipher, for instance, the different, uh, differential uh, no. linear capital analysis or things like that. There are no rationals about the security of this black cipher against classical. Um, well, we, we decided not to use like, linear or differential cryptanalysis actually because of the dependence on the key. So it felt like if, if we did that, we'd be exploiting, say, the linearity mm. in the S box, mm. but that that would be key defined, and so it wouldn't generalize yeah. well to yeah. all of the keys. Yeah. Thank you. No other question? Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>